welcome to the Mavens of Marketing, a weekly podcast hosted by me, Rachel Durkin. And me, Carrie Barrett. We talk all things marketing, innovation, sales, and business growth strategies, and the standard tried and true marketing techniques. Come for the conversation, stay for the savvy insights. And the borderline inappropriate jokes. To our fabulous audience, thank you for joining us for this episode of the Mavens of Marketing. I am one half of your lovely and talented co-hosting duo, Carrie Barrett. I am joined by the also lovely and talented Rachel Durkin. How are you? Hello, hello. I'm so happy to be here and I'm very excited about our guest today. I am too. So he, he lives in Montana. Um, he doesn't sound like he lives in Montana. He's got an interesting story. He's moved all over the world. He's been involved with and worked for household name companies, but I'll let him dive into that a little bit. Tim Pollard, it's lovely to have you on the show. Thank you for being here. Kerry, thank you. It's a, a pleasure to be spending time with you guys. <laughs> Why don't you share with our audience, if you don't mind, a little bit about who you are and what you do? Sure. So I, I run a company which I started about a decade ago called Aratium, and, and we exist to solve one very simple problem. In fact, we're very narrowly focused on that. Um, most companies struggle tremendously with their messaging. You know, even if you have an exceptional solution, you know, stunningly designed by brilliant engineers of different stripes, it's incredible how many of those companies just cannot tell that story as effectively as they would like in the marketplace. Their messaging generally, whether it's through sales or marketing channels, a little bit substandard. They lose deals. They should be winning. Business doesn't grow as fast as it should grow. That's been an endemic problem for years. Um, and what's really interesting, of course, it's been that problem has been amplified by a post-COVID world as, as most messaging, particularly sales conversations, have moved into a virtual environment. And what we have developed, I think, is an incredibly effective solution to get companies back to the quality of messaging they would like to have. And they typically, when they when they deploy this model, they do see a, a pretty substantial improvement in, in sales and marketing outcomes. So gonna, that's gonna, what we exist to do. We're gonna jump into that solution and that equation, if you will, to fixing that problem. But first, you're being a little bit bashful. I just wanna share with our audience, when I say you work with household names, I'm talking, Disney, IBM, don't be bashful. You've worked with the biggest names in the world. Um, we do. We're very uh, fortunate to have developed the client list we have. We're a little company, but we do we do somewhat punch above our weight. But I think I think I think there's something interesting there, which is the clients we work with are often those companies like IBM, Schneider, Merck, Ernst and Young, Salesforce, LinkedIn, companies that have very complex often solutions. And the more complex the solution, the more likely it is your messaging isn't going to work because that complexity finds its way into your messaging, which is particularly toxic. So yeah, we have a we have a, a wonderful group of clients, and it's been really fun to work with them and see their messaging get get transformed. You're totally speaking my language because I always feel that messaging is overlooked by marketers. Often, um, we're always looking at the pretty colors or the branding or that or the go to market, which is those touch points and the easy stuff to see. And of course, of course, always talking about the target audience, but the messaging and how you communicate with people, it almost requires like an emotional intelligence, right? And a psychology to it. Tell me, and the bigger the company gets, the more salespeople they have, the more opportunities for that messaging to go very, very wrong yeah. <laughs> and, in yeah. different directions. So tell me a little bit about why and how messaging goes so wrong. That's interesting. You introduce a whole lot of interesting themes there. I mean, there's absolutely... A, a balance needed between sales and marketing messaging. Marketing messaging, just traditional understanding of this is, it, it, it helps you at the top of the funnel, but that's no good if you can't then close the funnel as you move forward. The, um, I think when you look at the way companies do messaging, there are typically, there are lots of mistakes to get made, but there are three particularly toxic hallmarks. And particularly when I talk about how do you structure a sales conversation, the first is TMI. People just pack an insane amount of information or try to into their communications. This is a very typical deck from a tech company, one of the companies we work with. I mean, any one of these slides could be a day's conversation of itself. There are fonts here that only dogs can hear. Um, <laughs> our motives are good. We want to be thorough. We want to be complete. We want to know that we know our stuff, but we create, we create complete uh, cognitive overload. 
The second one is that most messaging, honestly, is thoroughly confusing. And what I really mean by confusing is the value prop that this company is bringing is just completely unclear. And again, I mean, I'll stick with this deck, but I have dozens of these that I go through this. And I'm like, man, there's so much stuff here, mm -hmm. technical detail. And de but like, why do I care? What exactly? How are you exactly going to help me? grow my business. I mean, this is all to do with too much information, a lack of logical narrative flow. And um, we love to introduce complex terms, acronyms that we assume our customers will understand, but that's a horribly dangerous assumption. So most messaging just is just nowhere near clear enough. And then the third one, which I think is particularly toxic. And again, it's it, it often driven by a good motivation. But but um, so much messaging is incredibly sender oriented. It's just all about me. This is a great example. This is a deck from a company before we, we started working with them. And they're in the smart grid space. And, and, and the product they have is breakthrough. It's revolutionary. So do they start by talking about the problem that it solves? No, they start with a picture of their building, a picture of the campus on which that building sits, a picture of other buildings in the States, some buildings in Canada, yay Canada, and then they also have buildings in China, Brazil, Mexico, and then they just start a rant on their, their own mission, vision, and values. And in a world where people are looking to disconnect because they're over-communicated with, this is just giving them the reason they want to switch off. And some clients would never have gotten past those first 10 slides. So I, th I think these are the most toxic hallmarks. And I don't know if you want me to go there now, but what's really interesting is what the consequences are of this. What are the outcomes that this leads to? Because they're, they're really quite devastating. I, I am going to ask you about that. Two things. Number one, you're talking about something I think we're all familiar with. I like to call it death by PowerPoint. I've hardly ever been to one that is even remotely able to hold my interest. And, yeah. I, and I know I'm not different from everybody else. Number two, you are demonstrating what is amazing communication and you're using some technology to do it. Before I ask you about the downstream effects of that poor communication, for those of you who are listening and not watching on the YouTube channel, what is this board that you're drawing on? And are you actually writing backwards? <laughs> um, that's, a, that's a secret. Um, this is a technology we developed basically. We call it a mirror board. Uh, sometimes it can be called a, a light board. Um, honestly, no, I'm not writing backwards, although I'm a sales guy, so I can. I'm writing on a pane of glass in front of me. The camera is then inverting the image, which is why my wedding ring is on my wrong hand, if you yep. care to notice that. What's really good about this, though, is this is really next generation whiteboarding. And as we'll see later in the conversation, this is very helpful in any presentation context to boost learning, because at no point will you become disconnected from anything I've said. I will lay the board out as I talk. And you will always have it as a sort of living cross-reference. Decks suck in every respect. That's the first point you made. The problem, by the way, this is worth a moment. The problem is not PowerPoint. PowerPoint is a vehicle. Sure. And the problem is the fundamental intellectual architecture of the message, yeah. which is what I was describing here. Yep. But PowerPoint is a problem. And no presenter should ever use PowerPoint and never in sales. And that's a radical thought, but none of the clients we work with use PowerPoint for selling yeah. when we're done with them. And, and, and you'll see why in a second. The other problem with PowerPoint is it's episodic. Whatever was on slide two is long forgotten by slide 15. At the end of our conversation today, you will have the whole argument laid out in front of you. And that's why learning comprehension just uh, goes up so much. So um, anyway. No, this is amazing. It's, it's And I, I'm just going to reiterate this. If you are If you are listening to this, please go to the Mavens of Marketing YouTube channel because I promise you will want to see what Tim has just been talking about and how it works. So let's get back to that question. What is that sort of downstream repercussion from poor communication, bad communication, boring yeah. communication? It, it's fascinating because there are two outcomes. One is obvious and somewhat understood and one is completely misunderstood. The first outcome is that too many sales meetings are just not compelling. Um, you know, you're, you're in sitting talking to a customer, they have the problem that you solve, there ought to be a great sales outcome, and you don't get it. And it's not because the solution was bad, or your price was too high, it's simply because the messaging was so poor, you did not articulate the value proposition clearly enough. So that's devastating. 
Now, you would tend to think there can't be anything more important than that, right? No, there really is. There's something more interesting and more important than that, which is almost all messaging in sales, when it's done the way it's traditionally done, fails what I would like to call the retellability test. Now, I, would, I believe personally that retellability is the single most important word in communications and without question, the single most important word in sales communications. But it is so poorly understood. Uh, of, of everything I'm going to say today, this next five minutes is by far the most impactful and important. Think about how sales works. So this is, this is me. And let's imagine I'm trying to sell something uh, to you, Kerry. So this is you and I'm having a, a sort of a typical one-on-one -on -one sales conversation. Now, is that meeting important? Yes, of course it is. Is that the most important meeting? No, not even close. Sometime later, there's another meeting. It's a meeting I don't get to be invited to where this uh, legendary, shadowy, decision-making body of the customer is deciding whether to buy my solution or my competitors or my solution versus do nothing. And in that moment, the key to sales, has nothing to do with me in that moment. It's whether you, Kerry, can effectively retell my story effectively. And the problem with almost all messaging is it's failing pretty badly in the first meeting, but it is utterly non-retellable. And by the way, this is the specific reason why I would never sell using a PowerPoint, because I don't have time to get into this, but people will not represent someone else's slide deck. There's lots and lots of reasons why. But just imagine, imagine if you somebody presented a deck and they, they, they fire hosed you death by PowerPoint, are you ever going to load that up, fire it up and represent it? You have absolutely no chance of doing that. Now, if that's true, there are three colossal implications here. Number one, and anyone watching this, if you know that your messaging is kind of weak, it's okay in the first meeting, you have to assume it's failing catastrophically in the second meeting. Why? Because in the first meeting, you are there to navigate around the weaknesses of the deck. Let's say I'm a typical seller and someone built this deck for me, sales enablement, sales operations, marketing, or I just threw it together. It's not great. So you know what, I'm gonna kind of wrangle it. And even though it's crap, I might be able to create a reasonable conversation out of it. But the problem is I'm not there in the second meeting. So your ability to retell the story is based largely on the quality of that document. And, and you're not there to help it. So if it's not great here and you're having to wrangle it, you know it's disastrous here. The second implication, is really interesting is what should our goal be as we build messaging and i think marketing needs to think about this as well as sales because it's true across anywhere in the in the pipeline is the goal first meeting success do you want a successful first meeting yes but is that the real goal no your goal has to be second meeting success in other words you're building messaging that's so crisp so compelling so powerful so customer centric that this person is fully able to retell the story. And I don't think that's the standard we set. We build messaging to try and have a good conversation here, but we are not setting the standard here. When we work with clients, it would be wrong to say I'm not interested in first meeting success, but that's not what I'm really interested in. Everything we do is getting clients to messaging that's so good, it survives right through to here, the second meeting. Of course, if you get two, you automatically get one. And then the third uh, reason I think is the biggest and most interesting point here, it gets then to the very role of messaging itself. Is it the role of a sales message to persuade? Trick question. Yes, of course it is. Is that its only role? No. What this means is it is equally, if not more important, that your message equips, not just persuades. Go back to me and Kerry. So Kerry, I'm I'm having this sales conversation with about anything, our messaging solution or anything. Do I need to persuade you? Yes, but that's not good enough. If you're persuaded but ill-equipped, you can't be effective here. Now, why is that so important? Because if I asked a thousand sales leaders or marketers, do you build messaging to persuade? They'll all say yes. If I asked them, do you build messaging to equip specifically and explicitly? Not only will they say no, in fact, they'll say, I've never even really thought about that. So this this issue of retellability is actually the key to messaging. By the way, in any context, we do a lot of work doing leadership communications training. Well, 
if a leader is trying to change the direction of an organization using probably some form of communication cascade, what does their message need to be? Retellable. This is truly the key to communications and we don't think about it enough. So in sales, this is the obvious problem. Oh, I wish my messaging was more compelling. And what you need to be saying is no, I wish my messaging was more compelling and I wish it was a hell of a lot more retellable. And, and, and our model is built to give you this, which I think is what really does, honestly, truthfully, distinguish us from anyone else in our space. That's amazing, Tim. You've got a lot in your head. <laughs> I also yes. want to point out that Scary. I'm noticing that in your communication style, you're doing a lot of things that psychologically grab attention. So you said something at one point and you said, um, of anything I'm going to say to you today, this is by far the most important. Mm -hmm. Something like that makes people stop and listen to what it is you're about to talk about. You also outline things in steps so that, again, we can retell the story because they're actionable. And this whiteboard is amazing because we all know with the PowerPoint, one of the reasons they fail so badly, there's a lot of reasons, is because we have the attention span of a goldfish right now, you know, in <laughs> our environment or less. And when you turn your back to write on a board, I stop paying attention from a body language standpoint. Yeah. When when your PowerPoint is on for more than seven seconds, I stop paying attention. So this invention of yours, the fact that multiple things are happening and as I'm processing, I can reference back to the points and these, these retold, these retelling opportunities is key. So just for those of you, again, listening, go watch this video because everything Tim is saying he's doing and it's what's being impactful. So, so Tim, I feel that you've mastered it. Can I, can I comment on that? I really want to commend you. I don't know if a, an old English man and a young English, English woman can classify as brothers from a different mother, but, <laughs> but I, I, since I met you and we, we've had a conversation before, we clearly see the world through a very similar lens. What I love about what you just did is you're in fact reverse engineering out of what you're seeing, in fact, what are critical principles of communication. How do you make a message sticky and retellable? You need very clear articulation, and I am aiming for that. You want people, you talked about emotional connection. How do you get emotional connection? Often through visualization. So I don't just tell an abstract story. I talk about me talking or selling to Kerry, and then Kelly in this meeting, the table I don't get to be invited to. That's a deliberate use of visualization to helping you, helping you actually to bring a point to life. A logical narrative is essential. We are building, I hope we will build today, depending on where the questions go, a very logical story, absolute key um, to human comprehension. And then also the correct use of technology. By the way, a working rule of presenting is never in a virtual meeting have anything that's not you on screen for more than one third of the time. Is it okay to show slides? Yes, show a visual to support a point. And that might be, um, we might, I could have projected a visual that looked like this, but we teach our clients, do not project slides or anything like that for more than one third of the time. Because if you lose that face-to-face -face connection, mm -hmm. you're gonna create a real problem in a virtual environment. Because there is a very interesting question to be answered here is how does the virtual environment affect this? And that's like a whole interesting new topic we, we're all now starting to wrestle well, with. Well, I'm so glad you brought that up because that's what I was gonna ask you. <laughs> My, I was gonna say, you've clearly mastered the virtual environment conversation, but I'm, many I know have not. So if you did messaging mediocre before, it's even worse in the virtual environment. How yes. do you how do you combat that? Or and or this whiteboard being a great example, how do you leverage the virtual environment to be even more impactful? This is such a great question. I mean, can you be as effective in a virtual environment as you were in a live environment? Yes, absolutely. Uh, we do a lot of keynotes, we do a lot of training, we do them all from the, we have seven studios like this. Absolutely. But you gotta understand what you're doing. I, I think this is really interesting. So the world goes virtual. And immediately, everybody ran to the wrong problem or wrong solution. They said, well, the issue is platform. Okay, I need my sales guys to understand how Zoom works and I need them to, to share their camera and how do I share a document and let's not have nude children running around or mad dogs or things like that. Um, whoa, now, whoa, whoa, that's entertaining, but <laughs> and memorable. It, it might be entertaining, but that might still Im impede your communications okay, goal. I have a call recently, I kid you not, I swear to you, on my children's lives, this is true, I'm on a call 
Um, and, and I was one of a rather large audience watching a, a company make an investor pitch. And at the end of the call, there's a tile, tiles of people. One guy gets up and he has no pants on. I mean, whatever else <laughs> was discussed. Did you screenshot it? <laughs> no, I wish I had. I, I did message the organizer. I'm like, that was awkward. And I'm like, watch out. Now, the, the, is this important? Yeah, kind of. Uh, Bryce, can you throw up the witness protection slide? You seeing this? <laughs> this was a meeting I did recently. Uh, I'm selling. This guy is the buyer. He's the CEO of a major health system. He's making the absolute classic mistake of being backlit. If you're backlit, you can't be seen. It's just a horrible look. You know, if you have the camera too low, everyone's looking right up your, your mm -hmm. nose. I mean, there's we can teach people how to master the platform. We use an acronym called TRAPS, which is, is really interesting technology, uh, ambient sound. We can do that some other time. It's really easy. You can solve that problem in five minutes. That's not the real issue. The real issue is what you were getting at. This is crazy interesting. Selling, well, communication generally, but selling in particular is a uniquely social process. It's very interesting. If I was selling to Kerry or you, Rachel, I, it, it's a very delicate dance. You know, you might want what I'm buying, but you're not going to hand it to me and you don't want to show too much enthusiasm or I'm going to jack up the price. And so you've got this very delicate dance. And what's happened, this is ridiculously interesting, is it's moved into a thoroughly asocial environment, an environment that you might describe as socially sterile. Um, completely different dynamics. And there are three dynamics you want to be aware of because here's the big issue. The social, the change in social environment is going to radically amplify these mistakes. And if you made these mistakes in the live environment, they were hurting you, but here they will absolutely destroy you. What are the three? Number one is distraction. People in the virtual environment have a very high proclivity to self-distract. If I'm meeting live, it would be kind of weird for Kerry to pick up her phone. It would actually be rude. But if her camera's off, she could do whatever the hell she wants. Now, I want you to see the hyperlinks here. If I've already developed messaging that's confusing and unclear, how can that possibly work when somebody is creating these cognitive fractures? So think about that. That's going to mean at least two things. One, the mandate to simplify gets even more important. And two, there are certain things you can do to reduce distraction, like don't project slides. I can at least see you two right now, and I can't force you not to self-distract, but at least if we're having a face-to-face -face connection, it becomes less likely. These, these are so interesting. The second one is science is already proving that in a virtual world, you experience a loss of mental bandwidth. You kind of get less smart. That's not quite true. You don't get less smart. But the focus and intensity you have to put into this uh, conversation now, you've got to somehow tune out everything and focus on the screen, burns and depletes mental energy very quickly. Um, Zoom fatigue is a thing. It's real. You, you know, how do you feel after six hours of Zoom meetings? You just want to grab a bottle of something medicinal at the end of the day. You're, you know, I can sit through a three-hour budget meeting. Yeah, there you go. Um, hard seltzer at 11 in the morning. I love it. Um, well, technically it's one thirty, so you, let's let's take a step back, Tim. <laughs> Don't be I'm so English. judgy. <laughs> I'm English. It's middle of the afternoon in England, and I'm fine with that. But think about think about this. You've got somebody with reduced mental bandwidth. Well, now again, if your if your previous tendency was to pack too much in, and to make that complex and confusing, well, how's that going to work when someone has reduced mental energy? By the way, great tip for salespeople, and I'm hearing this all over the place now, make certain your sales conversations are in the morning with the customer. The customer's morning lets someone else get on the wrong end of their Zoom fatigue curve. A lot of friends in industrial sales are telling me now they're, they're selling day, especially if they're on the West Coast or Mountain Time, is 6 a.m. to noon, and then they're done because you don't want to be on somebody's afternoon schedule. And by the way, same for you, uh, sellers. Don't overschedule yourself. If you think you're as good on your fifth call at three in the afternoon, you're kidding yourself. Because the mental energy, the mental energy to do what I'm doing right now, is much higher than if I was in a live meeting. I'm, I'm having to sort of generate energy, as it were, and that's just not needed in a live meeting. So be very careful not to overschedule yourself. 
Are you saying thought, that you can tell that Rachel and I have been on a lot of calls already today? Is that what you're getting at? <laughs> but, but this is so true because Carrie, you preach this in all your trainings for video, you know, is that you have to be over communicative on video and oh, have, have too many expressions for it to come across even remotely similar, right? Yeah. I, and I, and Tim, I know you had had another point. I want to let you jump in, but I, I just, I have to piggyback off of what you're saying because I, I talk to people, business owners who are looking to create video content, put together sales proposals, whatever. And what I say is exactly what you're saying. There's zero context outside of this little box. You have no idea what's going on. And so your whole job is to make sure that whatever you're saying, whatever you're doing is received, number one, period, and received in the way it was intended. So having great light on your face is not just about aesthetics. It's about making sure that whoever's on the other side of that lens can pick up on some of those lost nonverbals. They can see yeah. your facial expressions. It's all part of the communicative process, but being aware that whoever is on the other side of the lens is experiencing the same challenges that you are. It, that's so insightful. I mean, we may not get to this today, at least beyond a very superficial level, maybe do some kind of follow-up, but in fact, it's even more, that is all true, Carrie, but I think it's even more profound than that. When you are thinking about any communication setting and especially a virtual you're going to have to completely rethink the intellectual architecture and structure of your message there's just no possible way that traditional messaging that was already wrong this is already something that wasn't working there is no way that can work in a virtual environment and then you're going to have to think about the piece you were diving into there a, a completely different type of and structure to the virtual meeting. I'll give you an example. In a live sales conversation, you never had to design interactivity. It would just happen. In most virtual sales meetings, the customer tends to go passive. If you project slides, that's guaranteed. You create a monologue and monologues don't land deals. So there are six, we believe, new skills to do with conducting a sales or marketing meeting, whether you're sales or not, by the way, but a meeting. And one of them, is the intentional design of the interactivity moment. We call it perfect question at perfect moment. What is the exact question you should frame and ask? By the way, that has to be rehearsed. And then, and then what is the moment at which you'll ask it to generate the conversation you're trying to have? And this is largely, this largely a whole basket of, of new skills here. And so it's incredibly interesting. So this is why it's so wrong just to say, hey, I can be a great virtual communicator as long as I know, you know A, remember to wear pants, B, know how to turn my camera on. Like, no, it's a little more complex than that. There is a, so, a, a seismic change in the social nature of the virtual environment. And so uh, that leads us to have to be much more thoughtful about what we do in response. And I think the companies that have figured this out, with or without our help, are just making hay now. Because no question that the companies that communicate well in a virtual setting will radically, are already radically outperforming companies that don't. And, and, but it's not, it's just not as simple as it looks. It's not necessarily hard, but it just, you just have to understand it. So Tim, and, and we recapped this a little bit earlier with some of the things that you're doing right, but you know, at a very high level, I wish we had more time. What does getting it right look like? Okay. Um, hey, let me just finish this because it'll drive people crazy. What was the third social change? It's, it's one we've referenced, but it's just loss of feedback or social cues. Selling requires me to see how you are responding to my argument and then respond to your response. And in most sales scenarios, especially again, if you project slides, you, you lose that. So the challenge is that the new environment lives at the confluence. So the simple answer is, uh, it's this. You need to think differently about the structure of your message, and there are certain things you need to do to adapt in the meeting if you're in a virtual environment. Here's a good example. This is the new messaging we built in conjunction with Cisco for WebEx. I'm a huge WebEx fan. I'm convinced it's by far the best platform, the most stable out there, and I love it. Well, this is the new messaging. This used to be a 60-slide deck, and what it is now is boiled down to four panels, a front cover and four panels. You can always simplify your messaging. It's an act of self-discipline. It's, it's not, uh, oh, well, people say to me, oh, our solution's way too complicated. I can't tell that story briefly. That's BS. You can tell any story in the, the, in the space you have available. So very quickly, and if we want to do some follow-up, we can do that. Um, 
you want to think about your message, which is the more important piece of this, through the lens now of new hallmarks. These were the toxic hallmarks. Very, very quickly, what are the hallmarks? Number one, extreme simplicity. You're not dumbing it down. You're making it elegantly simple, crisp, clean, simple. You respect the mental bandwidth of your customer or audience. That's a rule you just don't get to break because you feel like it. The second thing is any marketing or sales conversation has to be deeply grounded in a customer problem. We're here to talk about you, a problem that you have that's impeding your ability to get where you're trying to go, and how we can solve that for you. But that second movement of the symphony, how we can solve that for you, has to be the second movement. Because if you go in send oriented talking about yourself and fail to anchor in a problem, you have no chance of success. But nobody does that. None of these decks adequately unpack the customer's problem. In fact, you want to spend at least one third of your time on the customer problem, or you will not get sufficient engagement or motivation to act. Beautiful example of this. The front cover has what we often call a challenge question here. This is a WebEx talking to the CIO of, say, a large bank. Does it say on the front, introducing WebEx 4.0? No, because that's not in the least interesting. What it says is, with so many tools to communicate, why do your global teams still feel so disconnected? Boom. You want to solve the distraction problem, the engagement problem. You want to solve the sender or inter problem. Lead that way, because CIOs will instantly lean in on that question, whereas they don't have the slightest interest talking about WebEx. Three, make sure your narrative is ideas driven. Now, I do not have time to get into this, but the human brain traffics in ideas operates at the level of ideas. If, if, if you watch this film, what we're doing right now, or just listen to it, and somebody said to you later, what was that about, that old English guy? You wouldn't play a recording of this because you don't have one, not in your brain at least. What you might say is, oh, it's kind of interesting. He talked about this thing called retellability and the importance of, of the second meeting. Oh man, that was really interesting. And then he talked about the fact that the real issue here is the, the rise of the asocial environment. So you see what you've done. You take, the brain takes information and boils it to the level of ideas. So what great messaging will do is feed the brain what it's looking for. So all messaging, particularly sales messaging, needs to be oriented around two, three, four critical ideas of why and how you are the, the right way to solve this problem. That's absolutely fun fundamental. We don't store information like a hard drive does. We synthesize and reduce and boil to ideas. The fourth thing is those ideas need to be powerfully supported because we need those ideas to be remembered and retold. If, if, I, I'll show you an interesting example. Imagine I was trying to sell you a truck and one of my big ideas is that this truck can tow really, really heavy stuff. I could do that through data, like 10,000 pounds, whatever. But imagine I showed you this picture. Um, that is actually was from an ad that Toyota used over a decade ago, I believe. It hasn't run for years, but people still remember it because they, it, it's such an incredibly powerful visualization of an idea. How heavy is a space shuttle? I don't know, but I'm pretty sure it's heavier than my bass boat. So what we need to learn is through various tools, which is basically story, visual imagery, metaphor, or artifact, how to powerfully support an idea and make it memorable. Rachel, it's what you spotted earlier. When I turned this example, I gave you some visualization of it. The fifth hallmark is logical sequence. There has to be a narrative story. The human brain, I'll, I'll sit down because I'm painting myself into a corner here, as you can see. You know when we're going to be done, there'll be no room left. Um, the brain does awfully badly with random information, but most decks, there's no logical narrative arc or structure. Here's the good news. All sales conversations implicitly have a logical narrative arc because it's a symphony of three movements. Movement one, you have a problem and it's bigger and more serious than you thought it was. Movement two, we have a solution that will completely solve this problem and is superior to anyone else's in the market. Movement three, this is how it works, and this is how we move forward together. That simple rule will transform your messaging, problem, solution, action, because the brain does very well with a logical story, and that creates both comprehension, but most importantly, retellability. And then 
The sixth and final one, man, I wish I had more time to go into this, is a document. Your supporting document is the number one tool you have to drive retailability. And you can't be a deck. So what you want to do is a document, you would often call it a leave behind or a conversation guide. Do not call it a brochure because that's a different thing. It's a thing, but it's a different thing. But it is specifically built for retailability. So the first five are about the message. And then the sixth is, is fundamentally about how that message is carried, particularly into the second meeting. Do you have two minutes to see something ridiculously interesting? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I mean, I feel like that's been like, do you want to see the most amazing answer of all time? <laughs> no, we're good. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit, of a, it's a, bit of a trick question. Um, <laughs> we have a client and, and they love our model, but they wanted to validate my argument that it worked not because it was cute or cool, but because it actually works on the brain in a different way. So we got a cognitive neuroscientist out of Stanford and we got a load of people in a room and we broke them into different groups and we made the same presentation to them using a traditional model, PowerPoint driven slides, and then our model, which is this. And we actually were able to measure what was going on in their brains. Do you wanna see this? It's, it's hilarious and it's very cool. So first slide here, Bryce, throw this up. This is one of the guys. We put all these people in these brain scanners, deep brain, shallow brain, eye tracking. Uh, they, they almost all survived, which is good. The first image here is what is, is this is, I'll just show you two. Number one, look at this. This is eye tracking data of how somebody tracks through a traditional presentation with a PowerPoint slide. Now, the, the bullets here are kind of cute. They're arranged in circles, but let's not be under any illusion. It's still a bulleted PowerPoint. And what you see is the brain or the eyes of the audience, the customer here, desperately trying to find the big idea, the unifying idea, but they're not finding it. They're dotting around all over the place. And the really funny thing is look at that dark red shade in the upper left. Guess what? That's where the most focus and intensity went. Do you want to guess what's behind that? Nothing. Nothing. White space. And what the scientists said is absent some governing idea or, or framing structure, they just completely tuned out. Now, look at this slide. This is um, the same message but using the model I've described to you. And you again, you see two really gorgeous things here. One is the customer tracked perfectly with the argument. If you could see the time lapse, you would see they were painting it in the sequence that the, the presenter was presenting it, which means you're getting obviously a very high level of comprehension and learning and therefore the ability to retell. And then the second thing I think is fascinating is look at that dark red shade on the left. That's the deep end of the pool discussing the customer problem, which in this case was on that left panel. And again, if you want to you want to solve the problem of engagement and distraction, that comes from a powerful what we call problem deconstruction. And you see this very, very intense focus on the problem. So what we actually can see here, we know that when clients use our model, they see a dramatic improvement in sales uh, outcomes. But what's also interesting is we can measure that scientifically in terms of uh, brain activity. The other interesting thing, I won't put a slide up, is immediately after these presentations, people were administered a multiple choice test um, just to check factual learning. Had they just learned what they'd been presented? And the traditional group made 10 times as many factual errors as the group presented to using this model. And that's critical, right? Because again, comprehension uh, and retellability. So uh, I'm glad we got there. I know this will run a little longer perhaps than we planned, but this is incredibly important. This is how to fix it. This is very shallow, obviously. You, you, we have very cool e-learning and, and, and training to get into the tools for how to do this, but it is perfectly possible to get from this, which we all know doesn't work. It's what you said, Kerry. Nobody likes death by PowerPoint. They don't like doing it. They certainly don't like having it done to them. You can absolutely get to this. You just have to understand a little bit of the underlying science and the brain rationale, and then the tools that get you there. I... Honest to God, I, I am sort of hanging, not sort of, I am hanging on every word because what you're saying is so practical and tangible and it's things that you can execute upon immediately, restructuring even just the visuals of how we put together our communication. With that said, I don't have all the time in the world to listen to you. <laughs> so selfishly for me and also for our audience, where can people learn more about you, find you, see if they'd like to work with you? Where should they connect with you? 
Sure. I mean, uh, we, we have everything from, you know, the, I wrote a couple of books on this. I think our e-learning is, is breathtakingly good. I teach the e-learning. It's all done here on the mirror board. Um, a, a lot of companies are now using that to train people. So you can look on our website, obviously, which is aratium.com. Aratium is just uh, aratium. I should remember to spell it right, the I in there. Aratium.com, that's a Latin for an oral argument. But honestly, just email me, tim at aratium.com, and, and we can uh, b begin a dialogue. There's everything from deep end consulting, where we really work with clients collaboratively to fix their, their messaging. And then there's much more um, you know, self-service options. E-learning is just it's particularly good. It's very enjoyable, and it unpacks this in a, a great deal of depth. And there are sales and non-sales versions of that. So the, the sales version is probably the one people are most interested in, but we also have an executive version, um, which is uh, you, know, you might be finance or legal or HR and, and find that interesting. Wonderful. I, I personally will be contacting you. <laughs> Uh, I'm sure we can do you a, a deal there, Kerry. I'm sure we can help you with that. I love it. Thank you so much. You were amazing. That's very kind. That's very kind. You know, if you teach communications, you really ought to be reasonably good at it. So if you were bad, uh, it would have been a, a really standard big standard we hold point, ourselves yeah. to. <laughs> I would agree with you on that. To our audience, thank you so much for joining us for this episode of the Mavens of Marketing with Tim Pollard. We will see you back here next week. Same time same place. Bye. It's a teaser. Coming up on the next episode of the Mavens of Marketing, Teresa Heath Waring. Have you ever thought about the importance of a really quality lead magnet, what it can do for you, how it can bring people into your email list, and how it can infuse your social following as well? If you don't know how to create a great lead magnet or what it can do for you, this next episode is for you. It's coming up on the Mavens of Marketing.